Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you have joined us. Hey, every once in a while, we flip the script around here, and I speak first, and then we do the music, reflection, and worship at the end. Uh, if you're watching the entire service, if it's not just message only, that's what we're going to do. So thanks for joining us. Let me jump in. Uh, we've been in this series, Game Changing Attitudes, and we are wrapping up this series today. Let me just do a quick review on game-changing attitudes. We started with the attitude of gratitude, and then we talked about the attitude of reconciliation. And then one Sunday, we talked about having the attitude that there are no non-persons, that everybody is made in the image of God, and everybody matters. One week, we talked about you are what you eat. What you put in is what goes out. We talked one week about transformation over information. God longs and really desires for us to be transformed, not just to be informed. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a life interrupted and seeing interruptions as opportunities to love and to offer hope, maybe even miracles. And then last week at the communion table, we embraced brokenness for Jesus broke his body so that we in our brokenness could be healed. I want to wrap this series up, Game Changing Attitudes today. I'm excited about this message. The title... Use it or lose it. <laughs> Let me start with a quick story. The Romans built an aqueduct in Segovia, Spain, just north of Madrid in 109 AD, 109 years after Christ's death. For 1,800 years, 1,800 years, this aqueduct, it carried cool water from the mountains to the hot and thirsty city of Madrid. Nearly 60 generations drank from its flow. Then came another generation who said, this aqueduct is so great a marvel that it ought to be preserved for our children as a museum piece. We shall relieve it of its centuries-long service and labor. They did. They laid modern iron pipes. They gave the ancient bricks and mortar a reverent rest. And the aqueduct began to fall apart. The sun beating on the dry mortar caused it to crumble. The bricks and stones sagged and threatened to fall. And I want to put this on the screen right here. This is what they wrote. What ages of service could not destroy, idleness disintegrated. In other words, you have to use it or you end up losing it. You know, the wisdom of Scripture shows there's three things that we can do with our lives. Again, let me put it on the screen. We can waste our life. We can spend our life or we can invest our lives. The Bible calls people who waste their lives fools. I pity the fool. People who spend their lives, they spend their lives, <laughs> our culture calls normal. <laughs> Americans are good at spending, aren't we? Americans this last year spent nearly a half a billion dollars. Hang here with me. A half a billion dollars last year at Halloween buying costumes for their pets. Lord have mercy. I mean, because who doesn't want to see little Fido in a Dracula outfit? Come on. Americans spent this year $24 billion on Valentine's Day. One day. Americans spend $50 billion on makeup each year to fill in the potholes and crevices of our lives. We can waste our lives, we can spend our lives, or we can invest our lives. And Jesus says those who invest their lives are wise. Wouldn't that be great for Jesus to call you wise, to call me wise? Well, in the last week of Jesus' life before the cross, Jesus tells his disciples in a parable to be ready for his return. It's the first parable of three parables in Matthew 25. Jesus, the last week of his life, tells his disciples to be ready for his return. We must be ready. Well, what are we supposed to be doing while we wait for his return? Build some bunkers, move to the middle of nowhere, hide out until he returns? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die? Binge watch Netflix and Hulu until Jesus returns? Maybe let's just become cynical about everything, making sure we tell the younger generation that they missed out on the good old days and things will never be the same. I love the Middle Eastern expert, Ron Bracken, who said this, I am old enough to enjoy a bit of nostalgia, but wise enough to know that there haven't been any good old days since the Garden of Eden, and even those days didn't last very long. <laughs> I love that. Well, what are we supposed to be doing 
while we wait for Jesus' return. He says, be ready. Be ready. What are we supposed to do? Well, right after Jesus tells his followers in a parable to be ready for his return, he shares the next parable. He immediately shares a parable that we are to be investing our lives while we wait for Jesus' return. Let me read Matthew 25. Let me read part of this parable. It says, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He calls together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on the trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver invested and made two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them, to give an account of how they had invested his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver said, Master, you gave me five bags, and I earned five more. The master said, this is I love this. Master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver said, hey, I invested the two, I made two more. Master said the same thing. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And then the guy with one bag, he says, Master, I was afraid to lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. And the master replies, you wicked and lazy servant. Why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Now, this wasn't 2022 where there is no interest when you put money in the bank. But it says, then he ordered, the master says, take the money from this servant, the servant that buried the money, and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. And then I want you to read this scripture. To those who use well what they are given even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do, not have, who ha, who do nothing, even what little they have, they will, it will be taken away. Jesus declares, Jesus declares while we wait for his return, while we wait for his return, invest what you and I have been given. Use it or lose it, for what ages of service cannot destroy idleness, will. Let me just give you a few observations about this parable and investing. Just a few. These are obvious, but I think it's good for us to remember. One, everything we have belongs to God. Everything. In fact, the psalmist declares, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Everything we have is loaned to us for our 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. It says, the master entrusts his servants to invest his money while he's gone, it says in this parable. And we know the master represents God and we're the servants. God's property has been entrusted to us, relationships, talents, time, resources. Everything you and I have, it belongs to God. Second observation is God has given us all talents, abilities, all of us resources, Verse 15, he divided it in proportion to their abilities. Let me just say this. There are no no no-talent people. Everybody has something God has given them. Everyone has at least one talent. My wife, this is interesting because my wife has, she's just, she's she's jack of all trades. She has so many talents, and I only have a few, and I'm not being humble. It's just true. I have a few talents. She has a lot. The problem is my talents are just louder than her talents, (laughs) Romans 12, 6, we each have different gifts according to the grace God has given to us. We're all different. We've all been given different gifts, but we all have gifts. The third observation is God expects us to invest what he has given us. This is his expectation. While we wait for his return, invest what I have given you on loan. Because the Bible says one day you and I are going to be audited by God. That's what it says. You think being audited by the IRS is intimidating. One day God will audit our lives. Romans 14, 12, each of us will give an account to God. We will give an account of how we wasted, spent, 
or invested the things he has given us. The fourth observation is it's wrong to bury or waste what we have been given to invest. The first guy, five bags, invests, gets five more. The second guy, two bags, invests, two more. The third guy, one bag, digs a hole and hides the master's money. He does nothing. And I've always thought, this is pretty harsh, but the master says, you are a wicked and lazy servant. Why did he say you're wicked and lazy? Well, his sin, what was his sin? It was inactivity. It was doing nothing. You know, we get worked up all the time about people out there doing bad stuff, but maybe the biggest sin and detriment to our world is people who say they're followers of Christ, and they bury their abilities and resources and opportunities. The guy didn't kill anyone. He didn't lie, cheat. He, did, he wasn't dishonest. He just didn't do anything. And God, I believe this, would rather have you invest, myself invest, attempt to do something great and fail than to have us play it safe and to do nothing and succeed. John Greenleaf Whittier says, Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. You ever think about what you want on your tombstone? While I was preparing this, I thought, I think I know what I want on my tombstone now. This is what I want on my tombstone. Four words. At least he tried. At least he tried. You know, I meet a lot of people who say, yeah, they're people of faith, they're Christians, but there's no joy. They're they're cynical. They're afraid. They say, well, my spiritual life's flat because it's the church's fault. It's the politician's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's my spouse's fault. But I know every time... When you see somebody who says they're a Christian, but their joy is flat, there's not adventure in their life, it's because of one reason. They're playing it safe. They're sitting on the sidelines. They're spectators, and they're drying up for what ages of service could not destroy idleness has. So we learn in this parable, if the title of the message, the fifth observation, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's a universal principle, really. If you refuse to exercise, what do you lose? Muscle. If you refuse to use your mind to think, your mind goes dull. If you refuse to practice, you lose a talent. When my grandma was in her 70s, uh, we had a family gathering, and she was talking to my sisters, and I walked by, and I heard her say to my sisters, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And I thought, what are they talking about? And then there was some horror that went into me because I realized my sisters were newlyweds. And then to my shock, I realized my 70-year-old grandma was giving my sisters advice about romance. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Trust me, ladies, I know. And I became ill. No one wants to think about your grandparents that way. It'll knock the wind out of you. Only therapy has helped me on that one. Whatever skill, ability, talent you have, if you don't use it, you will lose it. But the converse of that is true also. Whatever you would like to have more of, start giving what you got. If you need more energy, start using energy for God and watch it multiply. It happens every time when I go to the food bank to serve. I'm driving to the food bank and I'm like, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. I could do a million other things. And when the food bank, when we're done, I'm all pumped up. And part of it's adrenaline, but part of it is I just invested in some of the most important things I could be doing in my life. If you need more time in your schedule, then start giving the first part of your time to God. If you need more money, give the first part to Him. Choose generosity over scarcity. As the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Whatever you need more of, start giving away what you got. And like a muscle, it will grow, stretch, become stronger and bigger. For the last observation is this. I love this part of the parable. If you use it, if you do use it, you'll be rewarded. Well done, my good and faithful servant, he says. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Imagine, I just want you to imagine, when God is auditing your life, you are standing before God, hearing those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Let's go celebrate together. Let me just do a, a quick caveat here. Um, you know, every culture besides the United States honors people as they grow older. The oldest generation is revered. They're listened to. Uh, they're allowed to have influence. Every culture, but sadly, not so much in the United States. But here's the good news for those of us who are growing older, which hopefully, if we're all growing older, if you're not growing older, you're dead. But anyway, we're growing older together. This is what experts say, that people from their 50s all the way into their 80s have the most to offer. Maybe physically they're not as strong or fast. May, they may get tired quicker, but at this point, we get to this point in our lives and we have wisdom. We have life experiences, insight. Many times we have more resources than we've ever had. Many times we're at our best and we're deeply needed in this world. The world needs, as we grow older, for us to be all about investing in our world. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage many of you. You're already doing it. But until we have one more breath, one more breath, we are to invest our lives. Harvard did a 20-year study and found that people who saw growing older as something positive lived seven and a half years longer than those who didn't. This is God's investment plan. We may retire from our jobs, but we're to invest our lives, our experiences, our resources until God calls us home or Jesus returns. For when our lives come to an end, we will stand before God, and the Scriptures tell us that we will be saved by God's grace. Not by what we did, but by what He did on the cross. We will not be judged by our sins when we stand before God. Grace will be our foundation, but we will be judged. We will be held accountable for time wasted, spent, and how we invested our time, talents, and resources. The Apostle Paul writes, writes that wasted time, neglected talents... Uh, squandered resources will go down in flames like paper and kindling that helps start a campfire. If you don't invest, you'll lose it. Paul's instruction is a warning, but it's also a gift. It's also a gift teaching us how to wisely live our lives. I wrote a blog about this, but when my son was young, we went to Six Flags and there was this ride that went upside down and your feet would hang free and you'd free fall and it was quite a rush, but it was scary. At a young age, he was intimidated by the whole thing. So when I tried to get him to write it, he told me he was happy not to. He was happy just walking around eating churros, drinking Slurpees, and hanging around to throw a ring around a bottle game and win a stuffed animal that nobody wins. And if you do win, you have to lug a 30-pound Scooby-Doo all around the park for the rest of the day. Churros and Slurpees and stuffed animals are nice, but it's not why you go to Six Flags. There's no adventure in that. Eventually, you get full bloated and you run out of money. The reason you go to Six Flags is for the thrill of the drops that put your stomach in your throat, the speeds that knock off your toupee, and the loops that send blood rushing to your head. You scream, you laugh, you might even wet your pants a little, but at the end of the ride, you know you are fully alive. I talked to my son. I talked my son into the ride, even though he was still content at hanging out with the churros, slurpees, and stuffed animals. I said, trust me. Trust me on this. And when he got on the ride, you could see the fear on his face. And when the ride started, he screamed a little, he laughed a lot, and he may have even wet his pants. But when the ride came to an end, the thought of the mundane life of churros and slurpees and stuffed animals had left his head. And all he could say was, Daddy, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And we did it again for the rest of the day. I share that because, friends, God has amazing adventures, amazing adventures for us all when we invest our lives, as we wait for His return and invest our lives in His kingdom. He has adventures that will send our stomachs to our throats. Trust me, our toupees might fly off and there will be blood rushing to our heads. Adventures that will make us scream, laugh, and maybe even wet our pants a little. But they are the adventures in life God created us for till the end of our days. As Jesus said in Luke, risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe, you end up holding the bag. It's interesting because the last three parables Jesus shared before he went to the cross, last three are the three parables in Matthew 25. So he says, well, I got to tell these guys what life's all about because I'm going to die, I'm going to resurrect, and I'm going to go to heaven. You got to understand there's three things. You got to be ready for my return, 
And while you're waiting for my return, you need to invest your lives until I return. So the last question today is, well, what are we supposed to be investing our lives in? And that's the third parable. Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the foreigner, the refugee, the naked, those that need clothes, those that are imprisoned. This is where we are to invest our time, talents, and treasures. Jesus makes it really clear while we wait for his return. And when you and I do, and many of you watching this, you do this already, it's addicting. And when you begin to invest in these things that Jesus calls us to, it is addicting. And we begin to say, Daddy, let's do it again. And let's do it again. And let's do it again. For who will regret hearing those words? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me close with a story. And then we're going to spend some time reflecting and singing. In the 1700s, John Wesley started the Methodist movement. He was known as a great preacher and a great organizer. But few realized that Wesley made enormous sums of money preaching. The sale of his writings made him one of England's wealthiest men. In an age when a single man could live comfortably on 30 pounds a year, his annual income reached 1,400. As a child, John Wesley knew grinding poverty. He was one of nine children. Once John saw his father Samuel being marched off to debtor's prison. John felt God's direction to teach at Oxford University. His position usually paid him at least 30 pounds a year, more than enough money for a single man to live on. John seemed to have enjoyed his relative prosperity. He spent his money on playing cards, tobacco, and brandy. While at Oxford, he had just finished paying for some expensive paintings for his room when one of the servants came to his door and it was a cold winter night and he noticed that she had nothing to protect her except a thin gown. He reached into his pocket to give her some money to buy a coat but found he had spent all his money on cards, tobacco, brandy, and the paintings he was hanging on his wall. The thought struck him that God was not pleased with the way he had spent his money he asked himself, will the master say, well done, good and faithful servant? He cried out, O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures on my wall the blood of this poor servant? As a result of this incident, in 1731, Wesley began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give to the poor. He records that one year his income was 30 pounds and his living expenses 28 pounds, so he had two pounds to give away. His next year's income doubled, but he still chose to live on 28 pounds, so he had 32 pounds to give to the poor. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds. Instead of letting his expenses rise with his income, which is such an American thing, he kept them to 28 pounds and he gave away 62 pounds. Fourth year, he received 120 pounds. And his expenses were still 28, so he, he, he gave 92 pounds. This practice, John Wesley's practice, continued throughout his life. Even when his income rose into the thousands of pounds, he lived simply and he quickly gave away his surplus money. These, let me just read these to you, I'll put them on the screen. These were his three favorite scriptures about simplicity, money, and stewardship. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. John Wesley's example and his teaching on money and investing his life was simple, but he offered practical guidelines. And this is what he recommends for those of us that are trying to invest our lives. It's a little counterintuitive sometimes because he said this, this was his rule about money. Get all you can. Gain all you can, he used to say. But this is why. He says, for there is no end to the good it can do. And then I want to put this on the screen. This is a direct quote from him. In the hands of God's children, 
Money is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, clothes for the naked. It gives to the traveler and the stranger where to lay his head. By it, we may take care of the widow and be a father to the fatherless. We may be a defense for the oppressed, a means of health to the sick, of ease to them that are in pain. It may be as eyes to the blind, as feet to the lame, a lifter up from the gates of death. Let me review. Everything we have belongs to God. God's given us all talents. He expects us to invest those talents as we wait for his return. Don't bury them. Because if I don't use it, I'll lose it for what ages of service could not destroy, idleness will. But when we invest our lives, we'll be greatly rewarded and we'll hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. So as we get ready to worship, I want, you to, I want, I want to read the words of John Wesley. He, he ended most of his sermons this way. Whatever he preached on, he would end with this. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Let's worship together. I've carried a burden too long on my I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yeah, I see it now. And I 
his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken from my regard And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all
And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. Goodness. 